This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Discourse on the method of rightly conducting one's reason and of seeking truth in the sciences by René Descartes. Part 4 I am in doubt as to the propriety of making my first meditations in the place above mentioned matter of discourse, for these are so metaphysical and so uncommon as not, perhaps, to be acceptable to every one. And yet, that it may be determined whether the foundations that I have laid are sufficiently secure, I find myself in the measure constrained to advert to them. I had long before remarked that, in relation to practice, it is sometimes necessary to adopt, as if above doubt, opinions which we discern to be highly uncertain, as has been already said. But as I then desired to give my attention solely to the search after truth, I thought that a procedure exactly the opposite was called for, and that I ought to reject as absolutely false all opinion in regard to which I could suppose the least ground for doubt, in order to ascertain whether after that there remained aught in my belief that was wholly indubitable. Accordingly, seeing that our senses sometimes deceive us, I was willing to suppose that there existed nothing really such as they presented to us, and because some men err in reasoning and fall into paralogisms, even on the simplest matters of geometry, I, convinced that I was as open to error as any other, rejected as false all the reasonings I had hitherto taken for demonstrations, and finally, when I considered that the very same thoughts, presentations, which we experience when awake, may also be experienced when we are asleep, while there is at that time not one of them true, I suppose that all the objects, presentations, that had ever entered into my mind when awake, had in them no more truth than the illusions of my dreams. But immediately upon this I observed that, whilst I thus wished to think that all was false, it was absolutely necessary that I, who thus thought, should be somewhat. And as I observed this truth, I think, therefore I am, Cogito ergo sum, was so certain and of such evidence that no ground of doubt, however extravagant, could be alleged by the sceptics capable of shaking it. I concluded that I might, without scruple, accept it as the first principle of the philosophy of which I was in search. In the next place, I attentively examined what I was, and as I observed that I could suppose that I had no body, and that there was no world nor any place in which I might be, but that I could not therefore suppose that I was not, and that, on the contrary, from the very circumstance that I thought to doubt of the truth of other things, it most clearly and certainly followed that I was, while, on the other hand, if I had only ceased to think, although all the other objects which I had ever imagined had been in reality existent, I would have had no reason to believe that I existed. I thence concluded that I was a substance whose whole essence or nature consists only in thinking, and which, that it may exist, has need of no place, nor is dependent on any material thing, so that I, that is to say, the mind by which I am what I am, is wholly distinct from the body, and is even more easily known than the latter, and is such that although the latter were not, it would still continue to be all that it is. After this I inquired in general into what is essential I to the truth and certainty of a proposition, for since I had discovered one which I knew to be true, I thought that I must likewise be able to discover the ground of this certitude. 
and as I observed that in the words I think, therefore I am, there is nothing at all which gives me assurance of their truth beyond this, that I see very clearly that in order to think it is necessary to exist, I concluded that I might take, as a general rule, the principle that all the things which we very clearly and distinctly conceive are true, only observing, however, that there is some difficulty in rightly determining the objects which we distinctly conceive. In the next place, from reflecting on the circumstance that I doubted, and that consequently my being was not wholly perfect, for I clearly saw that it was a greater perfection to know than to doubt. I was led to inquire whence I had learned to think of something more perfect than myself, and I clearly recognized that I must hold this notion from some nature which in reality was more perfect. As for the thoughts of many other objects external to me, as of the sky, the earth, light, heat, and a thousand more, I was less at a loss to know whence these came, for since I remarked in them nothing which seemed to render them superior to myself, I could believe that, if these were true, they were dependencies on my own nature, in so far as it possessed a certain perfection, and, if they were false, that I held them from nothing, that is to say, that they were in me because of a certain imperfection of my nature." But this could not be the case with the idea of a nature more perfect than myself, for to receive it from nothing was a thing manifestly impossible, and because it is not less repugnant that the more perfect should be an effect of, and dependence on, the less perfect, than that something should proceed from nothing, it was equally impossible that I could hold it from myself. Accordingly, it but remained that it had been placed in me by a nature which was in reality more perfect than mine, and which even possessed within itself all the perfections of which I could form any idea, that is to say, in a single word, which was God. And to this I added that, since I knew some perfections which I did not possess, I was not the only being in existence. I will hear, with your permission, freely use the terms of the schools. But, on the contrary, that there was of necessity some other more perfect being upon whom I was dependent, and from whom I had received all that I possessed. For if I had existed alone, and independently of every other being, so as to have had from myself all the perfection, however little, which I actually possessed, I should have been able for the same reason, to have had from myself the whole remainder of perfection, of the want of which I was conscious, and thus could of myself have become infinite, eternal, immutable, omniscient, all-powerful, and in fine have possessed all the perfections which I could recognize in God. For in order to know the nature of God, whose existence has been established by the preceding reasonings, as far as my own nature permitted, I had only to consider in reference to all the properties of which I found in my mind some idea, whether their possession was a mark of perfection, and I was assured that no one which indicated any imperfection was in him, and that none of the rest was a wanting. Thus I perceived that doubt, inconstancy, sadness and such like could not be found in God since I myself would have been happy to be free from them. Besides, I had ideas of many sensible and corporeal things, for although I might suppose that I was dreaming, and that all which I saw or imagined was false, I could not, nevertheless, deny that the ideas were in reality in my thoughts. But because I had already very clearly recognized in myself that the intelligent nature is distinct from the corporeal, and as I observed that all composition is in evidence of dependency, and that a state of dependency is manifestly a state of imperfection, I therefore determined that it could not be a perfection in God to be compounded of these two natures 
and that consequently he was not so compounded, but that if there were any bodies in the world, or even any intelligences, or other natures that were not wholly perfect, their existence depended on his power in such a way that they could not subsist without him for a single moment. I was disposed straightway to search for other truths, and when I had represented to myself the object of my geometers, which I conceived to be a continuous body or a space indefinitely extended in length, breadth, and height or depth, divisible into diverse parts, which admit of different figures and sizes, and of being moved or transposed in all manner of ways, for all this the geometers suppose to be in the object they contemplate, I went over some of their simplest demonstrations. And, in the first place, I observed that the great certitude which by common consent is accorded to these demonstrations is founded solely upon this, that they are clearly conceived in accordance with the rules I have already laid down. In the next place, I perceived that there was nothing at all in these demonstrations which could assure me of the existence of their object. Thus, for example, supposing a triangle to be given, I distinctly perceived that its three angles were necessarily equal to two right angles, but I did not on that account perceive anything which could assure me that any triangle existed, while, on the contrary, recurring to the examination of the idea of a perfect being, I found that the existence of the being was comprised in the idea in the same way that the equality of its three angles to two right angles is comprised in the idea of a triangle, or as in the idea of a sphere, the equidistance of all points on its surface from the centre, or even still more clearly, and that consequently it is at least as certain that God, who is this perfect being, is or exists, as any demonstration of geometry can be. But the reason which leads many to persuade themselves that there is a difficulty in knowing this truth, and even also in knowing that their mind really is, is that they never raise their thoughts above sensible objects, and are so accustomed to consider nothing except by way of imagination, which is a mode of thinking limited to material objects, that all that is not imaginable seems to them not intelligible. The truth of this is sufficiently manifest from the single circumstance that the philosophers of the schools accept as a maxim that there is nothing in the understanding which was not previously in the senses, in which, however, it is certain that the ideas of God and of the soul have never been. And it appears to me that they who make use of their imagination to comprehend these ideas do exactly the same thing as if, in order to hear sounds or smell odours, they strove to avail themselves of their eyes, unless indeed that there is this difference, that the sense of sight does not afford us an inferior assurance to those of smell or hearing, in place of which neither our imagination nor our senses can give us assurance of anything unless our understanding intervene. Finally, if there be still persons who are not sufficiently persuaded of the existence of God and of the soul by the reasons I have adduced, I am desirous that they should know that all the other propositions of the truth of which they deem themselves perhaps more assured, as that we have a body and that there exist stars and an earth and such like, are less certain, for although we have a moral assurance of these things, which is so strong that there is an appearance of extravagance in doubting of their existence, yet at the same time no one, unless his intellect is impaired, can deny when the question relates to the metaphysical certitude that there is sufficient reason to exclude entire assurance in the observation that when asleep we can in the same way imagine ourselves possessed of another body, and that we see other stars and another earth, when there is nothing of the kind. For how do we know that the thoughts which occur in dreaming are false? 
rather than those other which we experience when awake, since the former are often less vivid and distinct than the latter. And though men of the highest genius study this question as long as they please, I do not believe that they will be able to give any reason which can be sufficient to remove this doubt, unless they presuppose the existence of God. For in the first place, even the principle which I have already taken as a rule, viz., that all the things which we clearly and distinctly conceive are true, is certain only because God is or exists, and because He is a perfect being, and because all that we possess is derived from Him. Whence it follows that our ideas or notions, which to the extent of their clearness and distinctness are real, and proceed from God, must to that extent be true. Accordingly, whereas we not infrequently have ideas or notions in which some falsity is contained, this can only be the case with such as there are to some extent confused and obscure, and in this proceed from nothing, participate of negation. That is, exist in us thus confused because we are not wholly perfect. And it is evident that it is not less repugnant that falsity or imperfection in so far as it is imperfection, should proceed from God, than that truth or perfection should proceed from nothing. But if we did not know that all which we possess of real and true proceeds from a perfect and infinite being, however clear and distinct our ideas might be, we should have no ground on that account for the assurance that they possessed the perfection of being true. But after the knowledge of God and of the soul has rendered us certain of this rule, we can easily understand that the truth of the thoughts we experience when awake ought not in the slightest degree to be called in question on account of the illusions of our dreams. For if it happened that an individual, even when asleep, had some very distinct idea, as, for example, if a geometer should discover some new demonstration, the circumstance of his being asleep would not militate against its truth. And as for the most ordinary error of our dreams, which consists in their representing to us various objects in the same way as our external senses, this is not prejudicial, since it leads us very properly to suspect the truth of the ideas of sense, for we are not infrequently deceived in the same manner when awake as when persons in the jaundice see all objects yellow, or when stars or bodies at a great distance appear to us much smaller than they are. For in fine, whether awake or asleep, we ought never to allow ourselves to be persuaded of the truth of anything, unless on the evidence of our reason. And it must be noted that I say of our reason, and not of our imagination or of our senses, Thus, for example, although we very clearly see the sun, we ought not therefore to determine that it is only of the size which our sense of sight presents. And we may very distinctly imagine the head of a lion joined to the body of a goat, without being therefore shut up to the conclusion that a chimera exists. For it is not a dictate of reason that what we thus see or imagine is in reality existent but it plainly tells us that all our ideas or notions contain in them some truth. For otherwise it could not be that God, who is wholly perfect and voracious, should have placed them in us. And because our reasonings are never so clear or so complete during sleep as when we are awake, although sometimes the acts of our imagination are then as lively and distinct, if not more so than our waking moments, Reason further dictates that, since all our thoughts cannot be true because of our partial imperfection, those possessing truth must infallibly be found in the experience of our waking moments rather than in that of our dreams. End of part four. Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, March 2006.